please welcome to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Lawrence Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, and thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight uh, to support the Distinctive Voices um, series. Um, I would like you to indulge me, if you will, for about 55 minutes or so. It's 7.06. Um, and on a, a bit of a thought experiment about our future. And if you can, I would like you to try to step out of this, this time, this election year and, and recession from which we're still recovering, uh, this place, Southern California, and even step back, even out, step out of this country to, in this time, to look at where we're headed with the big trends, where the world might be going over the time span of, say, the next 40 years. That's a, that's a useful time frame because it's far enough out that it's big picture and allows us to see where some of these big trends are headed, while at the same time close enough, it's really not that far off, to be honest with you, close enough that the projections may be modeled and projected and be grounded in scientific reality rather than science fiction. And what my argument tonight is going to show, or what, what I will argue tonight, is that these major trends, not in technology, this is not going to be a talk about social networking, this is going to be a talk about trends that run deeper and more fundamentally, uh, more fundamental than that. And where they might be headed at the global scale, and also how they might be converging in some surprising ways to change other parts of the world that perhaps we're not so accustomed to thinking about, such as the northern latitudes of the planet. That will be the, what I think may, may be the fresh idea from this talk for you to take away tonight. So the four big forces that I have analyzed in my work and in, in my book um, are familiar to you, all right? These are population demographics, the number of people on Earth, what their birth statistics look like, where they're migrating to, what their fertility rates, what the age structures are, and so on. The second global force that I have analyzed is natural resources, the projected and likely demand of fossil fuels, especially um, where these deposits are found how accessible they are now, how accessible might they become in the future. The third global force is globalization. That's a big word, meaning many things, many people. I'm focusing in, in the talk today on economic globalization, and I won't be able to talk, cover the other aspects in this talk uh, as much as I would like to, but, but, but I've written about them quite a bit in my book. Uh, the fourth is climate change. And in this talk, I'll be talking about the steady, predictable sort owing to loading of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. I don't have time tonight to talk about the scarier specter of abrupt climate change, which has happened before in the geological past, and it could happen again. Uh, I have a chapter devoted to it, but there's just not enough time in 55 minutes to, to touch on that. So trust me, there's plenty going on, even with the predictable sort, without even needing to uh, get into the um, abrupt climate change world. Now, the... Um, and, and these four themes are recurring throughout my talk and throughout my book, and where you see those little symbols on the right, that will cue you in which of the organizing themes has come back at play. Let's start with population demographics. If we take the um, United Nations population division model, which is pretty much the gold standard with this type of model and research, and uh, project it forward, it provides a range of estimates of where world population is heading from a, a low estimate to a high estimate. The middle of the road projection being around 9.2 billion people uh, by the middle of this century. Okay, up from about uh, 7 billion people today. This is a, it, it's a growth rate that is slowing but still enormously fast. And, and the, um, the 20th century in particular was truly a remarkable century in terms of human population growth. In that 100 years, the world went from having 1.6 billion people to 6.1 billion people in one long human lifetime. Truly astonishing and a very important uh, uh, overall demographic trend. But of course, this curve only shows you the global picture. Most of that growth is being driven, of course, in the developing world. In the developed countries, populations are stable and in fact even dropping and falling which is raising the specter of some real economic and um, you know, uh, need for pension reform and so forth in, in these countries where populations are expected to fall in the coming decades. The second very important demographic trend that's underway, of course, is aging. 
Um, we're all aging as individuals, of course, but societies, too, are aging in their age structure. With a, this is happening all around the world, um, not just in the developed countries, but in the developing ones as well. China, for example, is about to undergo a massive and very rapid aging process, where more and more of the population is made up of people that are older than today. But in terms of resource demand and environmental impact on the planet, perhaps one of the most profound trends is this incredible rush that we are seeing of people moving from the countryside to urban areas. Now, this, with regard to this phenomenon, an incredible threshold was just surpassed in 2008. At some point, during, just four years ago, at some point in 2008, the world went from having more people living in the country, in, in, in cities, to the reverse. We have crossed the threshold. We now have more people living in urban areas than in the countries. That has never happened before in all of the history of mankind. Remarkable. We are truly an urban species. And this has big implications for environmental impact. Why? Because that same individual living a peasant agrarian life in China, for say, or in the countryside of India, has a much lower environmental demand, resource demand, than that same individual leaving a modern, a modern affluent life in the city. Okay, so I'm talking here about essentially um, successful cities. The, the cities of, um, of Africa, for example, are still very squalid and, and, and difficult, horrible, rather difficult places to live. Uh, their environmental impact, the consumption factor is lower. But this is a tremendously under-recognized impact of urbanization, which in urbanization brings many, many wonderful things. I'm not debasing it in any way. But in terms of the demand for electricity and materials and metals, this matters even more than the total number of people on Earth. In fact, much, much more. In fact, so much more that if all the world's population today, right now, 7 billion people, were to live as we Angelinos live right now and enjoy the standard of life we have, it would be equivalent to having about 72 billion people on Earth. So this is a very little recognized uh, problem. Now, and we're an urban species. We have crossed that line. For the first time in human history, the vast majority of us have no knowledge of how to feed ourselves or clothe ourselves or perform the most basic of biological functions, right? Instead, we increasingly rely on globalized companies like these to supply us with these very basic biological requirements. Now look, I live near Hollywood, I, I live in Los Angeles, and I like to go to Trader Joe's and it makes me feel good about myself. <laughs> but the reality is, from a, from a business model point of view, these two companies are doing exactly the same thing. Yes, there are differences in labor practices and, you know, there are differences in the details, but as a business model, both of these countries are reaching out around the world to obtain food and services and route them via global, tightly scheduled, tightly scheduled global supply chains to us, the urban consumer, as cheaply and as efficiently as possible. And it's not just food and goods that are falling under this category. Increasingly, environmental raw resources are, falling, are, are coming under this same model. Of course, we all know about the, the major energy companies, but this is true also for metals and increasingly even for water, which has traditionally been kind of more of a parochial and municipal type of industry. Even this, too, is coming under the purview of global multinational companies, particularly in the developing world. And we could argue that those efforts of those com companies are needed, because unless something really radical changes, the projected demand for energy is so great that their efforts are necessary to sustain the path that we're on. For example, the International Energy uh, uh, Authority has run these model simulations. They, they go out to 2050, which IEA doesn't do very often, but their most recent runs are back in 2010. And they calculate what, let's just look at electricity. Electricity alone, forget gas and all, you know, transportation fuels. They calculate forward what the range of, of likely um, um, energy requirements will be for, or energy sources will be to meet the projected demand for electricity in these growing, by the way, that sky, I'm sorry, that picture I showed you earlier was the skyline of Shanghai. Most of these cities, of course, are not growing in the developed world. They're, they're exploding in 
uh, in, in China, India, and also Africa, about to the tune of adding another um, Seattle to the planet every day. Now, with demand like that, electricity demand like that, even as we ramp up production of renewables and so forth, the sad truth is the pace of demand is so great that under no plausible, reasonable scenario does it seem foreseeable that renewables can completely step in and um, solve all of our problems because the projected rate is so, is so great. Now, that's not to say we should throw our hands in the air and say forget renewables. Quite the opposite. I would desperately need them, and we don't want to be see, still having this debate 40 years from now, right? They're needed more than ever. But the, the, the reality is we will be hunting fossil fuels at least for the next 20 or 30 years. It, it doesn't seem to be any realistic way out of that, that problem. And if you just take business as usual to put it in context and just extend our current trajectory, we're heading towards a world that is going to want three times as much coal and twice as much natural gas by the year 2050. Same thing is true for water. It's a very uh, sophisticated water demand model. It comes out of Germany. Uh, these orange tones show parts of the planet that are hot and, and or, that are water stressed today and being stressed, uh, extreme stress, severe stress being defined as 40% or more of river water being withdrawn for human use. And the story here, as you might imagine, this is the baseline situation and this is the situation by 2050. So the take home message, those parts of the planet that are hot, dry, and water stressed today will be even more so in the future, and this has nothing to do with climate change. This is purely from increased population and urbanization in these dry parts of the world. All of this has given rise in the book world to some pretty scary predictions of the future. Uh, when the Rivers Run Dry by Fred Pierce, uh, Resource Wars, Wars by Mark Michael Claret. Uh, these are, um, they paint this very frightening world of rivers running dry, conflict, even the outright war over resources. In fact, many would argue that the conflicts that we've seen in the Middle East, of course, may have their root in this very tension. Then, the fourth global force, climate change. Uh, let me make one thing just very clear at the outset. The climate change is real. It's happening. It has been happening for some time. Uh, the physics of this are beyond dispute. In fact, they've been understood since 1893 when a Swedish chemist named Svante Arrhenius worked out longhand the basic physics of radiated forcing. And thank goodness we have greenhouse gases, because without them, the planet would be about average, about 60 degrees colder, it'd be a lifeless ice planet. Life as we know it would not exist without this precious veil of greenhouse gases, which maintains a higher temperature uh, near the surface of the Earth. But it's beyond dispute that when you increase their concentration, temperatures must on average, on average, go up. Now, there are other things that also affect climate, okay? Solar radiation, volcanic eruptions, uptake by the oceans. I mean, I could do a whole hour on how complicated it is, but there's no disputing that when you add more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, on average, it changes, it changes the planet's energy balance and mean temperatures have to go up in a messy way. Now, um, in fact, it's a lot like the stock market, right? The stock market is, any trader would tell you, there's all kinds of crazy stuff no one can predict. And we all accept that. Yet, um, we also all just know and accept that over time, the stock market, stock market on average will go up. It has to. What does it serve? It has to. You have more people on Earth. You're creating more capital in the world. The markets just must respond to those pressures. But unfortunately, um, stockbrokers have done a very good job of selling that wisdom to their clients and done a much better job than climate scientists like myself have at, at explaining uh, these things. <laughs> now, the, um, this is the observational record so far. This comes from the 2007 IPCC report. There'll be a new updated report coming out uh, in the next year. Uh, the top shows global mean temperatures. It's a noisy signal but it's bumpily increasing over the entire instrumental record where we have weather station data. Sea level has been rising much more steadily. The oceans are a more sluggish system than air, and they've been going up three millimeters a year, steady as she goes, uh, really since the, the, our measurements begin. The uh, northern hemisphere snow cover is a shorter record. A lot of it's based on satellite. It's messier. There's some bigger error envelope, uh, but there's some signs that we're getting less snow in the northern hemisphere, although the signal is less clear than the, than the other two. This is observational fact. This is what has been measured. 
the models tell us where we are going in the future. The black line on the left, that's the instrumental record. The colored lines to the right show where the future is taking us, depending on the choices we make as a society. That's what each one of those colored lines, each one of those different colored lines corresponds to a different social path, all right? With the, uh, the lower line, the yellow and orange line being a, essentially an extremely optimistic scenario where we go full-fledged into renewables and impose a carbon tax and a great deal of conservation and so on. The red line being a very, very dire future in which we just burn all the coal we can get our hands on. As you can see, the greatest uncertainty is not in climate physics. The greatest uncertainty is in where society will go. Now, graphs like these are useful. They show the big picture for the world as a whole. But like the population graph, they mask some very interesting contrasts around the world. And this is where the story gets interesting. I love these maps. I, mean, I make all of my, every class I teach at UCLA, I make my students look at these nine maps, and now I'm going to subject you to the same thing. <laughs> and what we're looking at are nine snapshots of our climatic future based on repeat averaging of climate model projections, assuming three different social paths and three different time steps. The first, and, and colors indicate a change from the average temperature of today. With, orange, with the brighter the color, you can see the scale bar, meaning more and more change in the mean annual temperature. The, these nine maps show the time steps in the early part of the century in the left-hand column, the middle part of this century in the middle column, and the end of the century in the right-hand column assuming three different social paths, with the top row being a, an optimistic path, if you will. The middle row being a middle-of-the-road scenario, and the bottom row being a very pessimistic, dire path where we really just continue to burn uh, unabated uh, uh, fossil fuel development and economic growth. There are many lessons to be taken from these three maps. I want to focus here on just three. The first is that the choice we make as a society really does matter, especially over the long run, unfortunately. Just like a savings account, where a small spread in interest rates takes decades to see the difference, the same is true with greenhouse gas loading. But the lower right corner really is a furnace world with massive die-off of ecosystems as opposed to the top one, which is still damaged, but there's a big difference between the top and the bottom, especially on the right-hand side. But in the near term, the difference is not so great. Okay? And this is what makes climate change just a difficult problem as, from a policy and human point of view. It's a long-term problem. And we as societies are not set up to deal very well, especially in democratic societies, to deal very well with long-term problems, right? Our elections work on four-year cycles and two-year sub-cycles. Our uh, businesses work on quarterly cycles. We as individuals work on daily and weekly cycles and, and pressures. But 50 and 100-year problems just fail to gain traction. The second lesson to be taken from these maps is that global warming is neither truly global nor always warming. Some places stubbornly refuse to warm up. For example, this bullseye right in the North Atlantic Ocean, which remains pretty much the same temperature no matter how hot we take the planet. The physics of this are well known. That's the source of the North Atlantic deep water formation with sinking cell in the global ocean conveyor belt that redistributes heat around the world. Neither truly global nor always warming, which brings me to my third and final point. What's the one place on Earth that gets nailed and hit more than any other across all time slices, across all climate forcing social scenarios, where? The North, yeah, that's right, especially the far North. We, the North and especially the high Arctic will see and is already seeing climate changes double, four times, even eight to 10 times the global mean average. Already some crazy stuff is happening. This photo shows seal hunters in Greenland turned potato farmers. The seal hunting, in seal, traditional seal hunting and mammal hunting has been devastated all around the Arctic because when the ice goes away, the walrus and bearded seals that live on it, they go away too. And so also does the polar bear. Um, but potatoes are doing surprisingly well in this part of Greenland. So well, in fact, that the Dutch have sent uh, agronomists here to study why Greenland's potatoes are doing so much better than their own. Now, I'm not suggesting this will become a major cash crop or anything like that, but it is an unusual phenomenon. This summer, just a few weeks ago in July 2012, saw the most extreme melting of the surface of the Greenland ice sheet that has ever been observed. 
I was there with the field crew. We spent five weeks in the area studying the runoff. And you can see that's me in the photo and a couple other people. These rivers are just, I can't even begin to tell you how staggeringly beautiful and fascinating and, and terrifying they are all at the same time. Perhaps the oddest story I came across in researching my book is the story of this man. In fact, I was so fascinated by this um, that I, I, I begin the book with the story of this guy. His name is James Martell. He is a uh, businessman and big game hunter uh, from Idaho. And in 2006, in the spring, he paid a lot of money to go to Canada to uh, shoot a polar bear. Uh, hunting polar bears is perfectly legal in Canada if you're wealthy enough to pay all the fees and permits. It's around forty or $50,000 to do it. He hired some local guides. They took him out. They found him a polar bear, or what they thought was a polar bear. They, they shot it. They ran up. And then their excitement turned to confusion. Because at first, it looked well enough like a polar bear, but some things were not quite right. It had dark eyes, like a panda. It had uh, long black claws. It had a hump back. In fact, it had many of the physical attributes of what? Grizzly bear. That's right. Ladies and gentlemen, you're looking at the first ever documented occurrence of a grizzly bear polar bear hybrid ever seen in the wild. Two years ago, in spring of 2010, a second one was shot. This one was the offspring of one of those. So these creatures are not sterile. They are reproducing. Now, is this con in order for this to happen, required two things. It required grizzly bears to push far north into polar bear territory, and it required some very unusual behavior on the part of both animals, especially polar bears, both of which biologists are beginning to see and, and report. That said, is this conclusive proof of climate change? I don't know. No reputable scientist will take two isolated events and attribute them to anything. All right? Time will tell whether this is a local oddity or a arrival of a new hybrid species uh, around the north. What I do trust are seminal studies like these appearing in the top peer-reviewed journals in all of science. Nature and Science, these are the journals, that have run the numbers, they're called metastatistical analysis, where they crunch decades of biological census studies around the world, thousands and thousands of, of studies and observations, and show that on average, the world's mobile plants and animal species are moving north at a rate of about 6.1 kilometers per decade. Now, that may not sound like much to you, but it translates to five and a half feet per day. So imagine coming outside of your home or apartment every morning and seeing that your lawn has crawled north by five and a half feet <laughs> from the day before. It's fast. Phenological cycles, which is the annual rhythm of giving birth and birds migrating and bud bursts and caterpillars coming out, that has advanced, on average, by about 2.3 days per decade, which may not sound like much, but imagine every year on your birthday that your birthday arrived 10 hours earlier than it did the year before. These are very fast ecological transformations and are taking place right outside your window. My own uncle in upstate New York is a long-term woodsman, hunter, trapper, and he has witnessed over his lifetime some strange southern animals coming into his woods, such as in the, including the Virginia opossum and the gray squirrel. Of course, not all of these southern invaders are welcome or cuddly. The mountain pine beetle outbreak is, is devastated because of the drought has really damaged uh, another species, subspecies of pine beetle has damaged Southern California. Well, Canada has, timber industry has been devastated by this explosion of the mountain pine beetle in BC uh, and, and up parts of Alberta, Western Alberta. Now the pine beetle has always existed in these forests, but their numbers in the past have been kept in check by winter kill, okay? And the hallmark of northern climate change, what does, it wasn't apparent in those maps I showed you, because those are mean annual temperature changes, the hallmark of climate change in the north is that it's driven, dominated especially by the wintertime signal. Most of those mean annual temperature increases are being driven by milder winters, not hotter summers, although there are some hotter summers. This means we're seeing a lifting and easing of the fundamental, most fundamental restriction of life in this part of the world, the cold winters. But of course, the most dramatic, profound, just unequivocal evidence of amplified climate change in the North is this incredible deterioration of the Arctic Ocean sea ice cover. Now, unlike 
the South Pole, which is a continent of land buried under two miles of ice, which is almost a million years old and will always be there. Let's hope, if that goes away, forget it. The planet is a scorched rock, okay? <laughs> the Arctic is very different. It's an ocean surrounded by land. And its ice cap is thin, ephemeral sea ice, only a meter or two thick, that, come, that expands in the winter, it pulls back in the summer, uh, it's, it lives anywhere from a few months to a few years. It's very dynamic. Um, and every year, the ice comes back. This is the North Pole, of course, but in the summer, it melts back, and it reaches its annual minimum extent in late September of each year. And that area of annual minimum extent of sea ice has been bumpily declining ever since we first started mapping it in the late 1970s using passive microwave satellites. And you can see, you can see the trend there. Uh, the last five years have been the five lowest record years we've ever seen. In fact, last year, for the first time ever, both the Northwest Passage, which is actually a collection of passages through the Canadian archipelago, and a northern sea route over the top of Russia, both of those are briefly free of ice for a few days for the first time in human memory. And by the way, uh, next month we'll come up on the, next, you know, the 2012 year, and it's heading to be an all-time record low, break all of these records as well. Um, this has given rise in the popular press to one of the more breathlessly touted uh, benefits, if you will, of climate change in this region, the notion of increased shipping. And it's reasonable to say that. In fact, there's already some shipping taking place in the area today. I took this photo uh, by, at Churchill, Manitoba. There's actually a rail link that connects the Canadian prairies through Winnipeg north all the way to Churchill, which is on the shore of the Hudson Bay. There's a port there, and you can see this um, European tanker being loaded up with Canadian grain uh, on its way uh, back to Europe. Um, and it's reasonable to expect that this type of activity would increase as sea ice retreat, the sea ice retreat trend continues. Uh, you don't need a fancy climate model to know that. You can just look at the geographic distribution of shipping activity in the Arctic today. This is a map um, I put together showing the actual ship track data. These are real ship voyages that took place during the winter of 2004. That's when I had the data, when the sea ice was at its maximum extent. In the next slide, I'll show you what the same place looked like six months later in summer. The ice pulls back, the ships pour in. It's as simple as that. But look at the geographic distribution of this. These are not container ships looking for that long, sought out international trade route between Europe and the, and the Orient, as it was called in the late 19th century. Okay? I mean, there is a little of that. That ribbon across the top, that is a trade route between China and the US. But other than that, this is local destinational traffic within the Arctic itself. And to me, this is actually way more profound, way more scary, way more all kinds of things, opportunistic if you're, if you're a business person, um, than the prospect of, okay, maybe we'll have some shorter, some, you know, some trade routes between Asia and Europe and the US for a few weeks to months out of the year that's 40% shorter than the Suez Canal. Okay, that's great. But this, this port, these aren't container ships. These are fishing boats, oil and gas exploration, mining outfits, tourism, one of the fastest growing sectors in this region. This portends more human activity, economic act pre human presence, economic activity, and environmental damages in the Arctic itself, one of the last empty places on Earth. And that, to me, is more profound than a shorter shipping route. I argue, there may be some shipping, but I argue the real impact is gonna come from ships like these. These are tugboats. I took this photo at Hay River during the summer. This is the, the headwaters of the Mackenzie River, which goes out to the Arctic Ocean. This place springs to life in the summertime. Around the clock, tugboats line up 24 seven to get this stuff, get these boats loaded down the river and out into the Arctic. Why? Because shipping is the cheapest form of transportation. We're going to see more ships like these, tourism. Greenland's tourism economy is booming. Over a million people now visit the Greenland, uh, go to Greenland in cruise ships every year. And of course, resource extraction. This is a specially designed tanker designed to carry liquefied natural gas from the gas-rich Arctic region which of course, with the exception of Russia, is not established, uh, tied into any uh, pipeline system, and take it to markets all around the world. 
my um, PhD student, oh, sorry, back up. Um, the opposite trend is true on land. And this, again, is a bit of a surprise to the popular perception. The popular perception, especially in the media, is that, oh, the North is thong. It's going to open up all those resources. We're going to go in there and get those resources. And that's true if it's by ship, as I've shown. But the opposite is true on land. And there are two reasons. The first is thawing permafrost. Permafrost is, our land, permafrost is a condition when the ground gets so cold in winter that it remains frozen at depth, even in the summer when temperatures go above zero. I took this photo outside of Barrow, Alaska. It's the northernmost, northernmost town in our country. Uh, you can see the classic uh, polygonal shaped uh, ground that is very, um, very typical of permafrost landscapes. The, to give you a sense of scale, the little tracks that you see there, those are ATV tracks where the locals are uh, driving around and, and tearing up their tundra. Now, you can build on this stuff so long as you don't thaw out the ground. It's as hard as concrete. In fact, it's mushy on the top in the summer, but if you go there, you could suck, stick a shovel in it. It would be hot mud. There's mosquitoes flying around. It would go down about eight inches, and then it would go no further. It'd be hard as concrete because it's frozen. As long as that doesn't thaw, you can build on it. But if it thaws, then the material reverts to its inherent geological strength, which is typically wet mud in this part of the world. And something like this happens. This is a perfectly good Russian apartment building in Chersky. One morning, the tenants woke up, cracks in the wall. Three days later, the entire place collapsed in a pile of rubble. And you can insulate the permafrost against the heat put out by a building or a pipeline. In fact, for decades, um, engineers have worked out ways to do that. But you cannot insulate, insulate against the twin forces of milder winters and deeper snowfall, which is the other hallmark of northern climate change, because snow actually insulates the ground. You can't stop it. So building infrastructure and preserving built infrastructure in the high north with this permafrost will become much more difficult in the coming decades. Now, the second reason that land access will decline actually affects an even bigger area than the permafrost zone. And that is because of the, for the same reason, the declining viability of so-called winter roads, also known as ice roads. Okay? These are, like the name implies, these are temporary roads that spring up all around the north each year in winter. When the ground is mushy ground, long distances, pretty much an empty place, that the ground becomes hard enough that you can drive over the lakes, drive over the muskeg, and drive over these surfaces without damaging them. In fact, um, this is the, probably the most famous ice road in the world. It's the uh, tibet Quinquetro Road, which connects Northwest Yellowknife and the Northwest Territories to its famous diamond mines, which have made Canada a major diamond producer. Uh, I met with the owner of one of these, or the operator of one of these mines, and he said, look, without these roads, even these mines, that's it, they're done. You just cannot serve them with airplanes. So unlike biological life, which springs to activity in the summer in this part of the world, human activity springs to life in the winter when you can drive. Okay? For all the heavy cargo, construction, mining, all of that happens in the winter. In the summer, all you've got is you know, bush planes and airplanes buzzing around, but they're not able to do this kind of heavy, heavy uh, cargo. Uh, but no one ever heard of this until this show, Ice Roads. <laughs> And it's a great show. If you haven't seen Ice Road Truckers, you should totally Netflix it. It's fantastic. They're really exciting. But the drivers are always worried about crashing through the ice. And that's exactly what is going to happen more and more as these winters, warm winters continue. In fact, my student, Scott Stevenson, and I have been doing some modeling of this effect. Um, I don't have time to take you through it. It's just a snapshot showing the change between now and 2050 in this human access to the to the north. And, wherever you, and of course, it, it varies by month, naturally. It's a seasonal phenomenon. Wherever you see green, those are places in the water that are not currently accessible to lightly strengthened vessels today. It's called a type A class icebreaker. It's not a heavy icebreaker. It's not a regular ship, but it's, a lightly, it's like what they use in the Baltic countries. Those are places that are currently inaccessible to these types of ships today, but will become accessible by 2050. Wherever you see red tones on the land, those are places that are currently viable for winter road construction today, if you wish to put one there. But by 2050, that, that possibility will be lost. So rising access by sea, but falling access by land. 
If you're interested in this work, it was published last year. If some people are interested in transportation modeling, that, that's where you can find it. Okay, so that's the story. Maritime future, for better and for worse. For better, for business opportunities, for worse, for conservation of iconic polar species, not to mention you know, an oil spill in this region. Wow, it would really be very damaging. But this is where things are heading. Here you can see this, uh, this is a, a, a relatively new offshore oil terminal off the northern coast of Verende in Russia. You can see the tanker waiting for the ice to clear so it can move in and load up that oil and take it to markets around the world. And there is a lot of oil and gas thought to be here. In 2008 and 2009, this long-awaited study came out from the USGS. It was a preliminary assessment of what the ballpark estimates are for how much oil and gas may lie in the Arctic. And my, there's a range of estimates, of course. There's an upper bound, a lower bound. But the middle of the road projection is that as much as 13% of the world's undiscovered oil and 30% of its undiscovered conventional national, natural gas may be in the Arctic, mostly offshore and in pretty shallow water, less than 500 meters. That's a lot. And this is why events like this create such a stir. Some of you may remember back in 2007 a little furor in the papers about the Russians staking out the North Pole. Does anybody remember this? Yeah. Russians at the North Pole. Okay, well that expedition was led by this guy. His name is Dr. Arthur Cholengarov. He's a um, longtime Russian polar explorer. He also poli was a politician in the Duma. And in 2007, he uh, led an expedition to the North Pole by ship. Uh, they cut holes in the sea ice. They put in two little subs, including one that he piloted, and they dove 4,000 meters down to the muddy floor of the northernmost place on the planet and planted that titanium Russian flag. It was really a very daring um, uh, stunt. And um, this created a real stir over the next, during those months and over the uh, following years. So in fact, I was, incidentally, I was probably closer to Dr. Chilingara than just about anyone else at the time. I was in a, a Canadian icebreaker called um, the Amundsen. And, uh, but we didn't know about it. It took about three, four days. And then, the news went around the ship. It was a pretty exciting time. But over the following year, um, it, it created some impact. Uh, Scott Borgeson, writing in Foreign Affairs, without US leadership, the, Ar the region, meaning the Arctic, could erupt in an armed mad dash for its resources. Mil Jane's Intelligence Review out of London, writing, uh, military competition is likely to increase while there appears little opportunity for diplomatic resolution of the disputes. New York Times, a mad scramble for the shrinking Arctic. A, lo a lot of hype. Well, Will there be a war in the Arctic over its oil and gas? I have no idea. That certainly lies outside of the scientific bounds of this, this thought experiment that we're on. Only time will tell. No one can predict what politicians will do. But I will say, I, I mean, this is the scary rhetoric. You know, this sound familiar? The same theme of war and violence and resources. And will it happen there? I, I don't know. Uh, but I will say, based on a present raft of recent geopolitical events. All the current signs are that fear is, is probably overhyped, uh, at, at, certainly under the present leaderships of the various countries involved. Um, the biggest reason for it is owing to the presence of this amazingly successful piece of international law called UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, um, which governs all the world's territories and in coastal waters. Um, and, I don't have time to get into all of its provisions, but uh, what UNCLOS did for the world is it set some rules about who controls, for example, what's called the Standard Econo Exclusive Economic Zone, which is a 200 nautical mile strip along every country's coastline. And that's, that, that belongs to that country, the resources within it. They can set the laws within it and so forth. And UNCLOS also um, has a provision that allows countries to extend their exclusive economic zones out even farther not from planting flags, but by showing scientifically that the seafloor past the 200 nautical mile limit is a natural geological extension of the country's continental shelf. And because of the unusual geography of the Arctic Ocean, remember it's a small ocean surrounded by a lot of land, so there's a lot of coastline. And it's also very shallow, especially on the Russian side. As you'll see in a minute, much, nearly all of the Arctic Ocean will, is going to be carved up between five countries. And it's happening right now. And there's some other very recent geopolitical things. I don't have time to get through all of them. Most significantly, a, a long-standing dispute, even with the EEZs, there's some room for argument. This 50-year-long dispute was settled last year between Norway and Russia. 
Um, Hillary Clinton attended the Arctic Council meeting in 2011. This is very high level diplomatic work going on right now. And all the signs are that the, these Arctic powers, and by these I mean United States, Canada, Norway, Greenland, Denmark, which is Greenland, which is an autonomous region of Denmark, uh, and Russia, are not interested in going to war. They want to get the lines drawn, settle under UNCLOS, and let the energy companies go in and start developing. And let's face it, it's the same energy companies that are going to do the developing regardless of where the lines are drawn. And that has already begun. Last year, Exxon and Ross have signed a landmark deal to begin exploration and developing off of oil and gas resources off the northern coast of Russia. It has started. So let's bring it together. This is a, I'm a geographer, I'm in the geography department, and um, we do a lot of geographic information systems, and this is a custom map projection that I developed to show this part of the world that I've coined the Northern Rim for what it really is. It is a coherent part of the world. And if you think about most maps, what do we do for a map? You, to lit, and map, of course, the, the globe is round. To present it as a map, what do you do? You typically will tear the poles apart, lay the planet out flat, and the North Pole, the North and the South get bloated and stretched out and spread far apart from each other, and Greenland gets big, and you know, the Antarctica becomes a little ribbon of land across the bottom. Um, in fact, the, transvert, the Mercator projection was very popular with um, American cartographers during the Cold War because that particular projection made Russia look extremely huge and ominous and looming over the planet, and they'd color it red. But in fact, viewed from above in this map projection, um, the New North, as I call it, I see a collection of countries with a great deal in common, um, ringing a, an ocean, and um, with surprisingly peaceful borders. Even the Russian border with Finland is fine, and even between the US and during the height of the Cold War, I mean, the Bering Strait was not exactly a hotbed of intrigue. Um, and here we have, um, there's a lot in these maps, there's population density, permafrost infrastructure, I don't have time to explain it, but what I do want to show you, this is an overlay of the U.S. geological um, um, surveys, oil and gas assessments. You can see the deposits are very extensive. Next, I'm going to show you the overlay of the pending, likely claims, extension claims and sovereignty claims that are going to unfold under the provisions of UNCLOS Article 76 in the coming Decade, coming years, not even coming decades, it's happening right now. There's a lot of colors in those maps, I don't have time to explain them, but the take home message is you see a rainbow of colors. Each one of those is likely going to go to one of those five countries that I named. Most of the Arctic Ocean is going to be carved up under this law. It's Norway's already gotten their claim agreed to, Russia's is going to be adjudicated in the next year or two, three. Uh, it's, it's happening, maybe even the North Pole itself. But you don't need to imagine oil derricks proliferating offshore in the Arctic Ocean to know that this region is very important to the world's fossil fuel trajectory. Okay? It or, why? Because it already is right now. This area right here is uh, the northern part of what's called the West Siberian lowland in Russia. And the West Siberian lowland <coughs> Lowland proper is just below this circle. It's a vast plain of peat-covered mosquito bogs. It's where 85% of Russia's oil and gas comes from. It, when you hear about the Russians and their gas, and the Russians are turning off their gas to Europe, and the Russians and their gas, that's where it's coming from. Okay? I've been there three times. I can tell you it is a splay of pipelines going west to Europe. And frankly, I could argue I'd like to see the same splay of pipelines going south to China. Why? I mean, natural gas is, is bad, but it's less bad than coal. And China's currently building two power plants per week to meet their projected energy demand. I mean, it's not, I'd like to see it all solar, but if I can't have solar, natural gas is the next best thing. Um, but that's not happening. Anyway, I don't have time to, to get into it. The, um, it, but it, the West Siberian lowland uh, oil deposits are playing out and now developing is moving north to this uh, bullseye that I showed you, the Yamal Peninsula. It's stuffed full of gas and condensate. In fact, the first pipelines have already gone in. So this, is, this will just be an extension of the development that has already happened there since the 1960s. Um, so it really is true. When it comes to gas especially, uh, 
Russia is the world, for conventional gas, we don't, I'm not talking about fracked gas in North America, that's revolutionizing everything in North America. But with regard to conventional gas, Russia is the world juggernaut already and will be even more so in the future. Okay, I better pick up the pace. Here's the northern rim from, the, from our side, the North American side. Here we have the US Geological Survey oil and gas assessments the pending and likely uh, sovereignty extensions under UNCLOS Article 76. But even in North America, we don't have to imagine oil derricks in the Arctic Ocean, which isn't gonna happen for a long time, to know that this part of the world is a key player in the world, in the global energy markets. And what area am I referring to now? This place, where's that, what is that? Anyone? Those are the oil sands or tar sands, depending on your, your point of view, okay? Pro-development people call them oil sands. Environmentalists call them tar sands. Um, this, is, this is it. This is Keystone XL. That's where it's coming from. Now, let me tell you, I've been here, and I can, in my book, I, I could, couldn't help myself. It reminded me of, of Mordor, okay? <laughs> the oil sands, tar sands, they're nothing like conventional oil, all right? A barrel of S Saudi sweet crude is a dream compared to this stuff. Saudi Arabia, you go out to the desert, you punch a hole down two kilometers for $2 a barrel, out comes this miraculous fluid that powers the entire modern world as we know it. Let's not underestimate what oil has done for human society. Everything you see around you is possible because of it, okay? Now, and as those conventional reserves are be, those large fields are becoming harder and harder to find. We have, it, it, it is in decline. It must be in decline. Okay? It's this logarithmic law, as I could show you. We're turning unconventional sources like this are becoming economically viable. And it's nothing like, it's a very different process. Oil sands are basically where oil has seeped into the dirt, or sandstone, in the case of these, these deposits. And to get the oil out, you essentially strip mine it. You trundle it off to it, you crush it, you, put it, you truck it to the, essentially a refinery, you uh, crush it, you boil it, the rock falls, the stuff rises at the top, you um, pipe in clean natural gas because it's hydrogen poor, it's a poor quality hydrocarbon, it's actually called bitumen, not oil. You have to pipe in hydrogen gas to take the hydrogen out to enrich it, and the stuff has too much sulfur, so you take out the sulfur and you pile it up in these yellow pyramids, as you can see, which no one knows what to do with those quite yet. It takes more water, many two to four barrels of water to produce one barrel of the stuff. It takes more BTUs of energy put in than you get out. But when you're done, you have a liquid transportation fuel. This is the gold standard of transportation fuels. You can't electrify jumbo jets and heavy trucks. I mean, electric cars are great for passenger fleets, but you can't do the heavy cargo with it. This is, like it or not, this is really coming under play uh, as a part of the American um, energy economy. The, what the, the estimated reserves of these deposits have been pegged, are currently pegged at around 175 billion barrels. And to put that number into perspective, I'm gonna compare this number, which is, an, this is unconventional oil. Bit of an apples and oranges comparison, but I, I just wanna set the context. I'm gonna compare Canada's unconventional oil reserves with the global conventional oil reserves. Where does this put Canada in the world of energy oil endowments? Second largest on Earth. Second only to Saudi Arabia. Again, apples and oranges, but this is, this is huge. This is, this is really big. Um, okay. So, and the anticipated projection production moving forward based on lease sales, not models or anything else. The energy companies are buying up the leases, they're building long-term plans. The projected rate of growth is, is very fast. I've had to update these numbers even since my book came out two years ago. And um, uh, we're projected to ramp this up from 1.6 million barrels a day to uh, 6 million barrels per day uh, by the year 2040. 6 million barrels a day, put that into context, that's about uh, one-third of our daily use of oil right now. And oil consumption is in a decline. We are getting more efficient, so it's a very large number. But it takes more than some milder winters and uh, you know, some, lots of resources and some ice going away to, um, but actually, let me back up. One more point. This image of oil flowing from north to south 
over the border with Canada is exactly the right image to have in mind. Why? Because oil is specifically protected under NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, to flow unencumbered by any tariff over the border, also with Mexico. Okay, this is where globalization again re-enters the story. All right, these free trade agreements liberalize these commodity flows over the border, and they are a big part of what's enabling this uh, to uh, happen uh, as freely as it is from a legal point of view. And in fact, if we look at the northern countries, and I've, the nor I coined them the NORCs after the BRICS, the northern rim countries, the NORCs. Anyway, if you, take, if you look at the eight northern rim countries, and now I'm expanding the list to also include Norway uh, and Sweden and Iceland, we find which you kind of already know, that with the exception of Russia, these are the most trade liberal, business friendly, internationally globalized countries on earth. And I apologize for this really messy table. Uh, it was the only way I could figure out how to show this point. But what I've done here is taken a bunch of countries, including the eight northern ones, and just gone out. There are a bunch of different groups that grade countries on how liberal, how, how um, by liberal I mean trade liberal, uh, uh, how globalized they are. And all of these organizations have their own warts and their own agendas, like the, the Wall Street Journal Heritage Foundation is a very conservative one, for example. Uh, some of the others are much more liberal, human rights, political freedoms, and so forth. I, I just took them all and did a rank sum average to just give a sense of where these northern countries lie in the world. And we find, not surprisingly, that with the exception of Russia, the northern countries are the most trade liberal the most engaged in the global economy countries uh, in the world today. Half the economy of Sweden is tied up in foreign trade in one form or another. Um, so my point is, moving forward, if the globalized business model is the model of the future, and of the four trends, who, that's the least sure. Okay, World War I showed that that could all collapse overnight. Actually, on the eve of World War I, Europe was even more financially integrated than the world is today. And yet those leaders took their countries to war, even if it meant gutting their own economies in the process. So unlike the other three, which are kind of locked in, demographics and climate change, globalization could change. But if the current trend continues, these seven of these eight countries, leaving Russia out, are already are very well prepared to play in that world. Why? Because they're already doing it today and, and leading in, in today. But it takes more, this is the point I was turning to earlier, it takes more than some resources in milder winters, and a globalized business model to grow societies, civilizations, people. Right? It also takes people. My colleague, Jared Diamond, in his book, Collapse, famously asked the question, what causes societies to fail? We can turn it around and say, what causes societies to grow? And uh, one of the factors, if we've been touching upon many of them here today, and one of them is population growth. And thinking back to that world population model at the beginning, which showed you the global average, how do our northern countries stand up? Remember, many developed countries have either stable or falling populations. Well, the answer is pretty well, again with the exception of Russia, which is facing a rather remarkable population decline, owing to a number of reasons. Um, the others, seven of the eight, all have either stable populations or even growing. In fact, the big surprise here is Canada. Canada, which is projected to grow 30% in the next 40 years. One of the fastest growing developed countries on Earth. Now, I'm putting it up here with India and China. Canada has a very tiny population, okay, 33 million people. So I'm not suggesting that in absolute terms, this is a phenomenal growth for the world as a whole. But as far as the economic development within that country and the cultural transformations within that country, this is very significant, a 30% increase when many developed countries of the world are not experiencing this. And what's the big reason for this, of course? Why is this happening in Canada? Same reason it's happening here. In three words, successful immigration policy in the case of Canada. Canada actually has a very interesting immigration policy. It's very hard-nosed. It goes after language skills, education, working age, and... Um, uh, family reunification. Those are the same criteria that the United States also uses, but the order is reversed. In the United States, family reunification comes first, then sort of work and labor skills, and then at the bottom is a very small pool of political refugees, but it's such a tiny number that you can almost neglect it. 
So with Canada, they also have a tiny pool of political refugees, but they go after work skills first and family reunification second. Um, they rely very heavily on immigration and have throughout their history. And it is, they have done, I'm not over-glossing the frictions and tensions that are there. They're, they exist in Canada just like they exist in this country. But in many ways compared to the US, it's been a smoother um, uh, acculturation. I mean, they're Canadians, they're such nice people. And they, um, <laughs> they actually have a show, it, it's been canceled now, but a very popular show uh, in Canada is called Little Mosque on the Prairie. It's about <laughs> Muslims assimilating into traditional uh, uh, Canadian rural life. And I love this photo. This, shows, um, this picture shows uh, two guys. These are National Hockey League commentators preparing to call out a game of the Toronto Maple Leafs in Punjabi. <laughs> Punjabi is now poised to become Canada's fourth most spoken language. So, and this is important because again, the world as a whole is aging. And those countries that are resistant to immigration, I'm not saying I'm pro-immigration, I'm not saying anything, I'm just a scientist, but I'm just saying in terms of population growth, those countries that are resistant to immigration, take for example Japan, face a very different demographic future than countries like the United States and Canada, say, which are, which are still bringing in um, people. Okay, let's, let's summarize. I began the talk with a host of what I, the global push factors. They should be familiar already before you even came in this room. We're looking at a world of rising urban population and, and wealth, uh, rising along with that, rising demand for natural resources, particularly, unfortunately, hydrocarbons, at least for the near term, a globalized business model and workforce, water stress, a host of negative climate changes and problems that I just don't have time in, tonight to, to share with you. But let me tell you that they are serious and, and frightening. Uh, species extinctions and biodiversity loss. In the north, we have a somewhat different set of actors taking place. We're seeing milder winters, rising overall biomass and biodiversity, relative water rich wealth, which I didn't have time to get to, but the northern countries are already the envy of the world with water resources today, and will actually be even more so in the future. Uh, the northern countries are one of the few places on Earth where precipitation is expected to increase somewhat uh, with climate change. All kinds of natural resources and, and highly globalized economies that are well positioned to export those uh, resources to the world. Uh, sec secure peaceful borders, really, around all of them. Some favorable demographics to varying degrees. Uh, you know, very favorable in Canada and not so favorable in Russia, for example. Uh, some resurgent aboriginal populations, especially in Canada and the US. I did not have the time tonight to tell this remarkable story, but I devote a whole chapter to it uh, in my book. It's, it's a very positive story. I, in, encourage you to Google it and learn about it. Uh, and um, the perception as well of this opening and, and excitement about the region. Put it all together and I, I coined this the New North. My point being, this is a collection of countries that most of us think of as being low population countries on the edge of a map. But they too are changing under these it's global pressures along with, and in fact because of, the growing economies of the developing world. China and India and their associated economic might and demand for natural resources. It's not just China and India that are changing. And this is a part of the world that is also transforming very rapidly. So uh, in the, the eight countries, the NORCs as I, as I name them, um, they, I, I call them out here. So I thank you very much for your kind attention and I'll bring the talk to a close. Thank you.